The Black Doctors Podcast highlights the stories of minority professionals with the goal of inspiring others. Season 2 provides more episodes and features a wider variety of professions. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and share with others, because the next generation can't be what they don't see. Tune in every Monday to hear our stories told by us. Welcome back to this week's episode of the Black Doctors Podcast. This week, I'm privileged to be talking with Dr. Ed McDonald. He's a gastroenterologist. He's an academic clinician at the University of Chicago Medical Center. Dr. McDonald, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thanks for having me, man. It's good, good to talk to you as usual. Uh, I miss having you around the university, man. You're definitely, <laughs> your presence is definitely missed, man. Yeah, I definitely uh, miss being up in Chi-Town. So let's, let's, let's get into it. And what is a typical day like for you as a gastroenterologist? So it, it depends on the day. So first and foremost, my responsibilities are different than your typical gastroenterologist, primarily because I'm a gastroenterologist who specializes in not only general gastroenterology, but also clinical nutrition, and I also uh, specialize in weight management. So I have three separate clinics. I do different types of endoscopy, uh, dealing with nutrition, with regular GI stuff. Um, but on any given day, I typically will have either full-day procedures or half-day procedures and a half-day clinic. And my clinics are going to vary depending on what type of clinic it is. So I have a half-day of general gastroenterology clinic where it's mostly you know, diarrhea, constipation, bloating, abdominal pain, acid reflux, heartburn, etc., some Crohn's disease in there. Then my nutrition clinic, which is really a sick clinic. I mean, it is, it's a population of people who are, are, are very ill. So a lot of people who have malnutrition. I, I should call it a malnutrition clinic. Mm -hmm. um, so these are folks who can't eat the traditional way um, because they're not absorbing, because the line of their bowel is unhealthy for a variety of different reasons. Uh, that can be from Crohn's disease, from uh, and some of the, the patients who've had bone marrow transplants, uh, graft versus host disease. Uh, I have a lot of people who have cancer. So these are folks who uh, may even have end-stage cancer where the cancer has... Uh, cause a chronic small bowel obstruction. So we have to give them IV nutrition. Um, then I have a lot of patients, unfortunately, who have been victim of, of gunshot wounds and, mm -hmm. and uh, gunshot trauma. Uh, so they may have fistulas and other reasons where they can't eat the traditional way. Uh, so I have to focus on them. Then there's people with anorexia and just severe malnutrition because of psychological issues. Um, then I have my obesity clinic, uh, which is the opposite. It's people really trying to lose weight <laughs> right? Uh, as opposed to people trying to, to gain weight. And during my procedure days, uh, my procedures could be just regular screening colonoscopies where we're trying to uh, identify cancer and or prevent cancer by identifying polyps and removing them so they never have the opportunity to develop a cancer. And for your listeners who are not aware of what a polyp is, that's a precancerous growth that over time can turn into cancer, but it is not exactly cancer. So you can remove it before it actually converts into a cancer. So I do those. Then I may have procedures where we're putting in feeding tubes in the stomach or feeding tubes in the small intestine, or there are people whose esophagus may be uh, narrowed, and we have to use balloons to kind of open up the narrowing so people can eat, eat again. Or I see a lot of people who've had uh, bariatric surgeries where they may have had some narrowing at the connection points where they've uh, had the surgeries and their bowel has been reconnected, and we have to use balloons to open up those areas. So it's a lot of a lot of complicated stuff. And then if you're on the inpatient service, you're seeing a lot of people who have internal bleeding. So these are mm. people who are bleeding from, you know, ulcers, from blood vessels that can bleed inside the intestines or stomach or colon, or people who may have a, a tumor that's bleeding, and we have to figure out how to, to, to stop any potential sources of bleeding. So I feel like as a gastroenterologist, especially as someone who focuses on nutrition, we do a lot of complicated stuff. Yeah. And with the with our nutrition focus, we also focus on small bowel diseases. So most gastroenterologists don't deal with any procedures where they're keep getting deep into the small bowel. So I'm one of the few people in the state of Illinois that actually can do procedures where uh, we get deeper in the small bowel. So that um, puts me in close relationships with a lot of surgeons. So at University of Chicago, I work with a lot of um, it pretty much all the bariatric surgeons, and oftentimes if someone has a small bowel tumor, 
they uh, may call me and have me just go up to the, the OR and help them identify where the tumor is. Wow. And, you know, we'll do a procedure where I'm doing endoscopy and they're doing laparoscopy and we're working together at the same time. Uh, and, and it's, you know, for me as a non-surgeon, being in the OR with surgeons while they're doing surgery <laughs> and me telling the surgeons what to do, it, uh, it's, a, it's a good feeling, especially <laughs> You know, having gone through medical school and been in the OR, right. you know, you have everybody yelling at you when you're the medical student and you're trying to suture or cut the sutures and they're like, too short, too long. It's <laughs> payback. Uh, yeah, it's payback. And I tell people like, look, man, you know, do this, move your, you know, trocar this way. And like, I want you to do this. And it, it's good to, you know, for someone, I think one of the benefits or the beauty of being a gastroenterologist it's like we're one of the closest things to surgery that's not surgery. <laughs> yeah. So I, I still get, you know, uh, my taste for surgery satisfied uh, without actually having to live the, the rigorous lifestyle that sometimes can be associated with surgery. Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty awesome. I definitely had no idea that that was all encompassed in the field of gastroenterology. So you practice in primarily an academic model. How would that differ from practicing in private practice as a gastroenterologist? Yeah. So, I mean, at University of Chicago, uh, one patient population, it may be a little bit different. So at a tertiary care center like University of Chicago that has a particular focus on cancer, I, I see a lot of cancer, uh, a lot of it. And we're also a level one trauma center, so I'm going to see more gastrointestinal problems stealing, stemming from trauma, gunshots, uh, penetrating abdominal trauma, et cetera. So your average private practice gastroenterologist is probably not going to have that acuity of patients to some degree. Mm -hmm. So most private practice, and one, in private practice, you're not going to focus on nutrition. Uh, that's really just an academic thing for the most part. So your private practice, they're pretty much just going to be doing general gastroenterology, which is mostly abdominal pain, maybe some Crohn's disease. And some of the private practice docs, uh, since they do general gastroenterology, they also function as hepatologists. Hmm. So for me, I get to be a little bit more specialized. Uh, like I'm still general because I want to keep my general skills up. But since we have academic hepatologists, like I'm not treating hepatitis C and doing stuff like that, whereas a private practice and gastroenterologist may have to do some of that. Okay. Uh, with Crohn's disease and some of the advanced inflammatory bowel disease, we have inflammatory bowel disease specialists. Uh, so for a lot of those patients, I don't necessarily have to be the one that's treating inflammatory bowel disease, whereas a primary gastroenterologist in private practice they're kind of a jack of all trades and they're doing all of the above. When, when people get really, really sick, that's when they start to send patients to a tertiary care center or academic center where I work. Right. No, that's, that's awesome. And since, you know, you could choose to work pretty much anywhere you, you want it with your skill set, but you've chosen to work at an academic hospital on the south side of Chicago. What does that patient population mean to you? Um, why are you there? Great question. So one, I am a Southsider. I was born in Chicago. I live on the South Side. So working in the same neighborhood in which I live uh, has its own set of advantages. I mean, one, it makes for an easy commute. So that's uh, less time <laughs> that I have to spend in the car and more time I can spend with the family or even I, I ride my bike to work. So, I mean, just the health benefits alone of just being able to ride your bike to work uh, is important. And I, 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 I'm willing to stay here uh, for, for that alone. That's a, a reason that I would consider just definitely staying on the south side. But ultimately, um, when I think about some of the reasons why I became a gastroenterologist, health disparities is one of them. And uh, we clearly know that there's health disparities when it comes to uh, both the incidence and mortality uh, related to colorectal cancer. So in Chicago specifically, uh, African-Americans in Chicago have uh, two times, uh, the, the rate of death from colon cancer is two times higher in African-Americans than it is in uh, non-Hispanic white people, uh, white Chicagoans. Wow. So 
that is something that growing up in Chicago, it, like I didn't necessarily know the epidemiology, but I knew people who had colon cancer. I mean, going to church, you hear about everyone sick and sudden with colon cancer. So as a you know physician, knowing that epidemiology is not surprising. Like, you know, like I saw this growing up. Um, and since Chicago is a relatively segregated city, the majority of the African-American population is going to be on the south side and certain neighborhoods on the west side. Uh, so for me, being one of the few black male academic gastroenterologists in a city that has higher rates of black men having colon cancer, uh, being on the south side makes sense. Um, so I get to, to impact uh, my community, and I feel like on the south side of Chicago, at University of Chicago, that gives me a, a better, it puts me in a better position to really be the impact that I want to be. I think it's absolutely incredible, and thank you for your service. Thank you for the work that you're doing on the south side of Chicago. And, it, 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 you know, people, it, it means a lot. So, like, when I go to the grocery store and I, I go to Mariano's, mm -hmm. and I'll just walk into the, the grocery store, even the Whole Foods <laughs> over here on the south side. Yeah. And when I walk in and just, you know, randomly see people that I've done colonoscopies on, and I just, you know, I'm just picking out vegetables and people come up to me like, hey, Dr. McDonald, you could have did my colonoscopy. <laughs> <laughs> to, to me, that, that means something. Or, you know, pre-pandemic, if I go visit a church or something like that, and, you know, the pastor's just like, hey, Dr. McDonald walked in. He did my colonoscopy. <laughs> and... The pastor will talk about, you know, why you need to get colon cancer screening. Uh, so I, I appreciate being in that position. Yeah. And if I was working, you know, in the suburbs somewhere um, where, you know, the population may not necessarily uh, really appreciate my importance and my value as a as a black male gastroenterologist, like it wouldn't be the same. Right. But but here, um you know, I feel like I'm needed and appreciated. That's amazing. Um, and speaking on health disparities in the black community with colon cancer, obviously, uh, we just lost one of our greats, uh, Chadwick Bozeman. And one of your posts really struck me because you wrote two years ago, you wrote the article, Six Reasons Why Colon Cancer Doesn't Exist in Wakanda. And yeah. um, I mean, incorporating that into this message of public health. Um, since then, you know, you've collaborated with other black gastroenterologists and other gastroenterologists, uh, Dr. Enkedia and Dr. Gray as well, to kind of raise awareness about this disease that's affecting the black community. What would you tell the public and what would you have us tell our family and friends um, about colon cancer and, and what we need to do to avoid this, uh, this disease? Yeah, so that's a, it, it's a timely topic, and I, I feel like I'm still in mourning. I mean, I was a, a big fan of Chadwick Boseman. I mean, ever since I first saw him in a movie 42 and his subsequent movies, he came out, it seemed like he came out with a profound movie almost like every year since yeah. 42 came out. So he was, you know, pretty much uh, becoming my favorite actor. Uh, and almost like instantly when I saw him, like, man, this guy is a, there's something special about him. So when I saw that he passed away, it, it, it hurt. Um, I mean, I've, I've, we've seen a lot of celebrities pass on and, you know, some, their impact or their loss is more significant I feel like he's one of those people where this loss is, is particularly hurtful. Yeah. Um, and, and when I think about specifically with the black community, I, I mean, in the past 15 years, I feel like the two things that I think were most celebrated amongst black people were Barack Obama's election yep. and, when, and when the movie Black Panther came out. Yep. <laughs> Like, I've never seen, you know, folks go to the movie theaters dressed up in daishikis and stuff like this. Yeah, just we were there. I, yeah. Like, I've never seen it before. <laughs> um, so there, there, there was something particularly special about him and that movie. So when the movie came out, uh, I wrote a post uh, about colon cancer. So it came out in March, uh, same month as Colon Cancer Awareness uh, Month, and I decided... You, you know, when you're doing community outreach and you're trying to to reach a community, you you, you have to sometimes think about think outside the box in mm -hmm. terms of how do you make messages stick. 
uh, how do you make messages resonate in a way that's different than just saying, you know, colon cancer, you know, has higher rates in this community and colon can, you know, this is a colonoscopy. So I was trying to figure out a way to get creative yet still effectively convey a message. Right. And I thought about using the movie that obviously was very popular as a way to convey that message. And, um, you, you know, at that time, I don't know if you remember, there was a hashtag like in Wakanda. Yeah. 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 Uh, um, or, and everyone's doing Wakanda forever, but like in the, in, in Wakanda hashtag, people were, were using Wakanda as almost a metaphor for this idyllic black life. Utopia. Black idea, yeah. A utopia, you know what I mean? This is utopian vision. And in my mind, you know, if you think about a utopia, like health disparities would not exist in the utopia. Right. <laughs> And you take it a step further, it's just like, well, I don't think we would have as much colon cancer in Wakanda. Uh, so, like, my hashtag in Wakanda is not a whole lot of colon cancer. Yeah. Um, and then I, you know, flush those ideas out. So one of the reasons why I thought there wouldn't be a lot of colon cancer in Wakanda, and, and I wrote this not knowing that the brother Chadwick had colon cancer right. as he made that movie. Man. Uh, like, he had colon cancer then, and I had no idea. Um, like who would have thought, but it, it, in the spirit of the movie, uh, I thought there wouldn't be any colon cancer in Wakanda, uh, primarily because one people in Wakanda seem like they knew their family history. So if you look at Chadwick Boseman and black Panther, I mean, they knew all the Panthers for generations. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I feel like if one of the black Panthers had colon cancer, somebody would have known that and people would have been screened appropriately. Uh, whereas in America, uh, we may not necessarily be as forthcoming when it comes to uh, sharing our family history with our family members. Mm. Uh, a lot of times people can be very secretive and, you know, people aren't necessarily sharing their business or, you know, people aren't really talking about their colonoscopies with their brothers, sisters, or the parents may not be having the, that conversation with their, their children. And it is important because, um, uh, our family history can impact the age in which we should start having colon cancer screening. Um, and I feel like in Wakanda, they would be, they would have been aware of that. Right. <laughs> and a, another reason why I thought there was less colon cancer in Wakanda compared to America is that in Wakanda, it seemed like most, they were mostly vegetarians. Um, so I, I think there was a scene, uh, where, uh, the quote unquote colonizer was, uh, in the mountains and they were like, are you going to eat me? And, uh, <laughs> And he made a joke like, man, we're mostly vegetarian. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we know that eating a diet rich in fruits and vegetables, specifically a diet that's high in fiber, typically has been associated with a decreased risk of colon cancer. Whereas a diet rich in uh, red meat and ultra-processed meats and maybe even ultra-processed processed foods can be associated with an increased risk in developing colon cancer. So I feel like the, the average diet in Wakanda is probably going to be healthier than the average standard American diet that we have. Yeah. Uh, therefore, the risk for developing colon cancer, in theory, should be lower. So another reason uh, why colon cancer is going to be less in Wakanda is people exercise. So you look at the Dora <laughs> Milaje, I, I mean, look. Yeah. Everyone in Wakanda look like they have been, you know, either working out or living a lifestyle where there's just a lot of physical activity within their daily lifestyle. Like, I didn't see anyone who was markedly overweight in Wakanda. Uh, at least, you know, obviously this is Hollywood. Forrest Whitaker was a little chubby, but yeah, that's about it. Forrest Whitaker, right, right. But, you know, he's been taking care of the plants. <laughs> <laughs> And Forrest Whitaker, he he he, he played an older brother. Yeah. Uh, and, and plus, Forrest Whit Whitaker, he, so Forrest Whitaker spent much of his time in America. <laughs> Touche. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, if anything, Forrest Whitaker probably would have been the the, the main culprit for for um, colon cancer, right. primarily because of the time he spent in America, uh, where he was exposed to the standard American diet. But nonetheless, uh, in Wakanda, most people seem like they were in shape. Uh, and we know that uh, having a maintaining a healthy body weight can be associated with decreased risk of developing colon cancer. Another reason why I thought colon cancer was going to be rare, less common in Wakanda is people weren't smoking. Like, I didn't hmm. see anyone smoking in Wakanda. 
I mean, could you could you imagine? You know, th- there's a fight scene with Black Panther, and somebody takes a spit cigarette break. Like, would it make sense? Right, right, right. <laughs> Uh, and then plus, you know, in general, in Africa, people don't smoke as many cigarettes as they do in other continents. Uh, so probably not going to have a whole lot of cigarettes in Wakanda. And plus, they were isolated from the Western world. Uh, so it's not like they're importing tobacco and whatnot. Um, so we know that cigarettes can definitely increase the risk of not only colon cancer, but cancer in general and chronic disease in general. So uh, that's one reason why there's less colon cancer in Wakanda. Uh, other reasons, I, I mean, uh, some of the obvious is that they embrace technology in Wakanda. Uh, so with healthcare in general in Wakanda, it seems like it's light years ahead of whatever we have in the United States. Right. But what we do have in the United States, we have technology that can help decrease our risk of developing colon cancer. So as a gastroenterologist, I get to use a lot of the technology. I mean, I'm doing colonoscopies. I'm using fiber optic cameras to decrease the risk of developing colon cancer that I look inside of people. I mean, if, if you had, if you brought somebody from like 200 years in the past and brought them right. today and, you know, they would see what I'm doing with colonoscopies and everything, it would look like magic. Like, wait, wait, what is going on? Um, so I, I feel like in Wakanda, the average person would embrace technology that exists to decrease their risk of illness. Now, yeah. in the United States, we're still trying to, you know, encourage people to embrace the technology that we do have. And, and I get the reasons why we have to encourage people to utilize that technology. I mean, one, there's um, lack of access. So the technology that we have is not universally uh, accessible uh, for a lot of different reasons due to insurance, due to, you know, financial reasons. Uh, there's transportation stuff, and there's a lot of stuff. Then there's medical mistrust, uh, which I understand. I yeah. mean, uh, in communities of color, we have a the, the history of medicine for communities of color in the United States. It is not the prettiest history. Not at all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's ter- have you read medical apartheid? Oh, yeah. It's sad. It is, it's sad stuff, man. So the, the, mis- this, the distrust and mistrust that exists... Um, There are a lot of reasonable reasons behind it, but we still have to figure out ways to take advantage of what we do have. (laughs) Um, So, like, these are obstacles that we're dealing with in order to get people to to utilize the technology that we have. But I felt like in Wakanda, you wouldn't have those obstacles. Yeah, well, I mean, once again, thank you for for all that you're doing, and rest in peace to our our brother Chadwick, but uh, it's great that the awareness that is coming out of this is is definitely going to save lives. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, if there is any silver lining to a tragedy, making people aware of colon cancer and getting people to, to get screened. I mean, even if it's, even if it's just one person who, you know, we can prevent a cancer and that is, uh, that's a step in the right direction. That's, that's turning a tragedy um, it, it, it really just trying to not let the tragedy just exist as a tragedy by itself. Like how we, how do we utilize what happened to him in a way to prevent it from some happening to somebody else? Absolutely. Oh man. On to, I guess a, a more positive subject. How does it feel Dr. McDonald to be married to a celebrity? Uh, it feels good. <laughs> <laughs> for, for those of you that don't know, um, Dr. Every Woman, is uh is married to to ed she is a obstetrician and gynecologist who also practices in the chicagoland area and she does a lot of education videos and parodies gone viral multiple times um so how does that work for the, the two of you you guys collaborate on projects yeah uh so oftentimes uh i mean i don't want to take any credit away from my wife uh she uh what she does is amazing and you know, she may ask me to come up with some ideas periodically. And, uh, you know, I may say like, hey, uh, since I have a background being a DJ and, you know, knowing hip hop and a lot of music and whatnot, like I may say like, look, you know, you should do X, Y, and Z song. And if I was doing a parody of this song, I would say something like this. And I may throw out like one bar or one line and then she'll take it and do the rest. And that's, 
that's only here and there. So I don't even want to take credit for <laughs> any of her songs. Right. You know, I may try to come up with some ideas with her periodically. And then uh, depending on what she's trying to do, she'll have me do some of the recording and audio engineering. And if she wants to do an original song, kind of like, you know, kind of like what you do. Like, I, I have enough equipment and musical know-how to recreate certain songs. Yeah. So I'll do the production and do the beats and, you know, hop on the keys, the bass guitar and the drum machine and, you know, put everything together. <laughs> there you go. You know, the ultimate power couple. It's, it, we have a busy household. And how, how has music influenced your career? It has influenced my career a lot. So, I mean, once upon a time, I was an Albert Schweitzer fellow. And the Albert Schweitzer Fellowship is a community service fellowship for community-oriented projects for health professionals. And the project that I had was actually using uh, music uh, as a way for health promotion. Hmm. Uh, So I did this as a a medical student. What I did was my goal was to train local hip-hop artists and spoken word poets as health educators. Really? Yeah. So um, I uh, recruited a bunch of poets and hip-hop artists that I had connections from my my years of DJing in the past. Uh, Once upon a time, I was actually a pretty decent DJ. I still (laughs) got got some skills. I'm I'm rusty. I have not DJed in many years. But, um, yeah, so what I was doing with that project, in order to find a venue to have my artists come in and do songs and whatnot, I actually had to DJ for free. So I, I told these places, I'm like, look, man, I'll be your free DJ if you just let me have people come in and, you know, do these performances. Wow. And that was agreement. Um, so I would basically train different artists on a healthcare topic, and they would take the information that they learned in my trainings and basically convert them to songs and then come in and actually do the performances. Wow. So I, and matter of fact, you see, people, people don't know the backstory. So my wife, uh, when she was a resident, she wasn't really doing any performances or doing anything. And she said she could write a poem on uh, breast cancer, and she wanted to perform it. And I'm like, why don't you come through and perform the song on breast cancer? And that was the first time she ever used any music or any poem or anything to actually educate someone. Wow. Yeah. True story. (laughs) It's it's crazy. I mean, music and, and the arts really do connect everyone and they're such a great medium for education yeah so for me i I support her and uh what what she does and then occasionally if i do like you know my own little educational stuff on instagram or you know social media like i put my own music to it but ultimately what i love about music um i i love it as a form of stress relief you know when i sit down at the piano or when I sit down on my drum machines, it, it, it's for me, it's almost a form of meditation. Like I am literally not thinking about anything else. I can go to work and see people dealing with all types of hor- horrendous conditions. I mean, literally at work, a lot of my time is spent with people who've been shot, people with metastatic cancer, people with, you know, severe illness that it's, uh, you're really exposed to a lot of, a lot of suffering, so to speak. And, I mean, I like being the person to help people through the suffering, but it's sometimes it's, it's a lot of suffering that you, you're exposed to. Yeah. And in order to keep yourself balanced, you need to have some sort of healthy outlets. Uh, so for me, when I come home and play music and make my own music specifically, like, I'm not thinking about anything uh, other than, you know, okay, if I, even if I'm just practicing scales, like, I'm just, you know, let me just practice scales and I'm just... That's all I'm thinking about. If I'm, you know, making my own song, I'm, you know, just focusing on the chord progression. Yeah. So for me, when I start thinking about that, I'm not, I'm not thinking about anything. Uh, I'm just thinking about the music. Yeah. And in the zone. In the zone. And it, it again, it's like meditation. Uh, so a lot of meditation, they tell you to clear your mind and just, you know, just kind of empty your thoughts and whatnot. And I feel like with music, it takes me to that zone where my mind is clear. Ed, can you take us through your, I guess, educational pedigree? You went to medical school at Northwestern. Um, Just take it from there and and let us know, you know, where you trained. and and... Gotcha. So first and foremost, I went to the University of Michigan for college. Uh, I would would be remiss (laughs) if if I did not mention the the University of Michigan Go Blue 
so that that was uh, you know my, my foundation and uh, I love Michigan um, uh, I, I love that college experience that I had and I also had some good research opportunities and some mentors uh, and met a lot of wonderful people who I'm, I'm friends with to this day uh, a lot of a lot of Detroiters so Detroit great city got nothing but love for Detroit then I went to Northwestern for medical school so uh, you know it's interesting I actually had a uh, a full scholarship to go to Michigan for medical school. And, wow. uh, but my parents got divorced, uh, the year in which I graduated and my mom had some, uh, some health conditions. Um, so I, and I had to come back to Chicago. Uh, now thankfully I had options where I, I could just be like, well, I'm just going to go to Chicago for medical school. Uh, but I went to Northwestern. So I got accepted to Northwestern and went to Northwestern. Um, did my med school there, and uh, in between my third and fourth year of uh, medical school, I, I started to become interested in GI, and I actually took a year off of medical school and did a, a year at the NIH in basic science. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, so I was working in labs. To this day, I could do, a, you know, immunohistochemistry and Western blots, like, with, with the best of them. <laughs> I, I was at the NIH and uh, came back, finished up my fourth year of medical school, and ended up matching... It's interesting. And so I actually had a terrible experience in my sub eye. So after finishing my year of the basic science, basic science, I came back and uh, I matched. Uh, my first rotation was my sub eye, and the resident I was was with. She was like the worst person ever. Um, it was it was like you know one of those horror stories in medicine where oh, no she way. was actively. Oh, yeah, it was terrible. I mean, she would actively try to sabotage me and, and like, lie to the attending and stuff like that. It was terrible. Uh, it got to the point where during my sub-eye, we didn't speak for, the, like, the last four weeks. And this is, like, a six-week sub-eye. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, I mean, I was a good enough medical student where I can just be like, look, I saw this person, admitted them, orders in, just co signed the bad boys. Done. <laughs> Man. Um, so that, that, that was my sub-eye experience. But, uh, after that, I was like, man, I don't know if I want to do medicine. I'm going to apply ER. Um, so I hurriedly put together an ER application and I applied ER and medicine. Uh, it, it was like a, a big deal because, uh, the program director at Northwestern, she knew, like, I was very vocal about how negative my experience was with this resident. Mm -hmm. And everybody knew that I was not going to be a gastroenterologist because this one negative experience. Wow. I ended up uh, interviewing for both ER and medicine programs. And I had a relationship with the chief of GI at Northwestern. Uh, I did some research in his lab. For me, I knew I wanted to be a gastroenterologist if I became, if I went into medicine. I knew if I wasn't a gastroenterologist, I would rather just be an ER doctor. So I ranked Northwestern Medicine number one, uh, which I felt that was my best chance in getting into gastroenterology. And the rest of my programs were all ER. Wow. So obviously I matched at Northwestern and did my residency there and had a, a great experience as a resident. So it, it's funny, like my sub-I experience, had nothing to do with, I, with what I actually experienced throughout residency. After finishing up at Northwestern, I knew I wanted to do gastroenterology, but at that time, I applied to gastroenterology as a third-year resident. If you applied at that time, you couldn't go straight into fellowship. You had to have, like, wait a year hmm. before you could start your fellowship. So instead of doing a, um, you know, like a hospitalist year or, you know, doing research again, I decided to do a fellowship in nutrition. So I was already interested in nutrition. A lot of it was health disparities, but a lot of it also was I remember seeing super sick patients that had nutritional issues. Like both of those reasons put me down a nutrition path. So as a resident, I had a clinic at the Jesse Brown VA, and I remember uh, I would see brothers coming in with diabetes, high blood pressure, strokes, and everything. I would look over their chart and see, you know, all the residents who took care of them before me, and all they did was just increase their blood pressure medications hmm. or increase their insulin. But no one really asked them, like, what type of foods they were eating. And I remember seeing one guy in particular who was just eating hot dogs every single day, every meal. Yeah. Hot oh, no. dogs. Yeah. And, I mean, the brother had erectile dysfunction, just got divorced, and he couldn't really cook anything. He had diabetes. He had high blood pressure. Uh, he was overweight, and he was just eating hot dogs. So I gave him some recipes. <laughs> uh, I, I literally wrote down recipes 
on the back of like a paper towel, you know, in the clinic. And I had him roasting vegetables and stuff like that. And so he stopped doing the hot dogs. I see the guy maybe like three months later and he lost a whole bunch of weight. His blood pressure was a little bit down. I'm like, man, what are you, what are you eating? And he's just like, man, I'm just doing uh, those roasted vegetables. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Did it fix his and erectile dysfunction? It did. Like uh, he, he was not calling me in the middle of the night for Cialis and whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, 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 so, I, it, you know, I was this idealistic, you know, black intern and I gave everybody my pager number and my cell phone number. I'm like, oh, I want my patients to be able to, patients to, to reach out to me, to call me and, and get in contact with me. Mm-hmm. And look, man, like brothers were literally calling me in the middle of the night for Viagra and Seattle. Cool. Like that. <laughs> I'm like, well, you know. I, it is two in the morning, but I I get it. You're, you're with your, your 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 old lady, so to speak. Right, right, uh, right. So I saw the power that food had in his life, and and simultaneously, when I was on my GI rotation, we had someone who had short bowel syndrome, and this person had. I mean, they were they were malnourished. They weighed like eighty pounds. They uh, were having bowel movements like twenty times a day. Their electrolytes were all messed up. And I remember being on rounds with one of the gastroenterologists at Northwestern, who's a very well-respected gastroenterologist. I mean, like one of the one of the best in the country. This guy um, was just like, you know what? I don't know what to do this patient. I don't know anything about nutrition stuff. Next patient. Wow. And I, I mean, I, this person's like on the verge of dying, and he was just like, next patient. And I'm like, man, mm. I need to learn more nutrition. So what I did was to combine the. The impact that I saw with giving people diets and recipes and also uh, the need for being more knowledgeable about clinical nutrition, I decided to do a fellowship in clinical nutrition at University of Chicago. And in the evenings, I went to culinary school. And since I'm not independently rich, I had to pay for culinary school out of pocket. Um, And I didn't want to take on any student loans. So on the weekends, I was moonlighting. Wow. Yeah, so I was working extra shifts Oof. in order to pay my, my own tuition for culinary school. Um, so did that, uh, ended up getting some publications that year, did some oral presentations for research. Uh, I, I interned for the Food Network. I was uh, one of the chefs on the Sandwich King season three. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So if you if you go back and look at specifically that season, like I made all those sandwiches, man. Uh, the talent did not make those sandwiches. Those were my sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> how, how was it behind the scenes on those shows? <laughs> oh, it was terrible. <laughs> it was absolutely terrible behind the scenes uh, because food stylists are, I don't want to say food stylists universally are horrible people, but the food stylist I was working with was a horrible person. Uh, whatever school that, that resident he gave me a hard time when I was a sub eye, they went to the same school of life. <laughs> So to to be a food stylist, you all you you ha- you have to be like OCD, but it's about the way food looks. Hmm. It, so it's one thing if you're like a surgeon in the operating room and you're OCD about you you know you're doing like a heart transplant, you're OCD about the process of doing a heart transplant. Like I get it, <laughs> right? Like please be OCD about that. But if you're <laughs> OCD about me toasting a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! It 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 it, it, it becomes uh, it, it, an interesting conversation. So I, I remember, you know, the 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 food stylist specifically came up to me one time. She was like, "Ed, so the next recipe, this is what we're doing, and then I want the sandwich. I want it to be GBD." I'm like GBD, and I, I'm a physician. Like I'm mm-hmm. like a board certified internist at this point. I'm like GBD. I'm over here thinking about like. Like, wait, <laughs> gallbladder, duck? Like, what are you, like, what is GBD? Uh, what are you talking about? And she's like, I want it to be golden brown and delicious. Oh. And I'm like, like, come on now. <laughs> that's not, that's not a thing. <laughs> that That's not a thing. That, so she was using acronyms. You, you ever look in, like, the medical record and you see all these crazy acronyms that you right. know aren't, like, standard acronyms? Yep. But, but like you just, somebody just wrote it in there and it just cause they're trying to use shorthand. It's just like, nobody knows your shorthand. Like this is not a standard acronym. So the, the, the food stylist 
it was a lot of stuff like that. And I'm like, this is not standard communication. Um, if you wanted to be golden brown, just say golden brown. Don't say GBD. <laughs> and then look at me like, like, why don't you know what GBD is? <laughs> so I make the sandwich, and it's like golden brown delicious. Uh, you know, next thing you know, she takes a bite out of my sandwich. And she oh. was like, the sandwich looks great. And she takes a bite. And I'm like, well, you know, it was for the camera. I don't, I like, maybe they want to have a half-bitten sandwich. I don't know what's going on. And she's like, Ed, what'd you do to this sandwich? The sandwich is so good. It's amazing. And next thing you know, she throws the sandwich on the wall. What? <laughs> she was just like, I said golden brown and delicious. <laughs> like, you had delicious. You had golden but it wasn't enough brown. Do it again. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I don't want to make it seem like we as physicians should deserve more respect than the average person in the world. Um, but as a human being, like, you don't treat people like that. Right. Like, physician or not. And <laughs> when she threw that sandwich, I'm just like, man, like, this is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. Uh, like, I had to... To swallow my pride and make another sandwich and go with the flow. Uh, but I realize, like, being the, the chef for, for television, it's not really what I'm trying to do in life. Mm. It's just not. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Morrow, who, it, it was his show. See, Jeff Morrow's a nice guy. And uh, we, we still keep in contact to this day. Uh, but the food stylist behind the scenes, it was terrible. And, and and most people don't see the amount of work that goes on for, like, an actual TV show. So you see, you know, a TV show like The Sandwich King or Ina Garden, and you just see, like, you know, one person up there cooking some stuff. Like, what you don't see is there's a whole team of chefs. So the, the, the show was filmed at somebody's house. So they rented out the house, mm -hmm. and we converted the garage into a makeshift kitchen. Um, so they had all these burners and we put refrigerators and like everything you expect in a professional kitchen. We had it in the garage. So we're making all this stuff. Like people don't see like all the lights and all the, you know, cameras involved and actually filming everything. And then, uh, in between takes, you know, like we're cleaning stuff up nonstop yeah. to make the kitchen look spotless. It is, it is a big ordeal. So there was probably maybe a hundred people working on this one show. Wow. Uh, which is just, you know, you would think like, oh, it's just cooking. Like, you just got one person cooking. There's literally 100 people. So it, it's a, a a big affair. Um, now, fast forward, I did all that and ended up doing my gastroenterology fellowship at Rush. So I uh, finished gastroenterology and uh, Northwestern needed someone to help out with nutrition. Rush needed somebody to help out with nutrition. But again, I want to come back to the south side. And I ended up coming to work at University of Chicago. And that's where I am. Awesome. Well, they're lucky to, to have you down there. Um, as, as we wrap up, you know, what would you say to medical students that are looking at different career options, possibilities? They may or may not have experienced gastroenterology that may or may not be on their radar. What would you say to those students? So gastroenterology is awesome. <laughs> First and foremost, I, I actually, I, I love being a gastroenterologist. I really do. Uh, I think I would have liked being an ER doctor, but I definitely love being a gastroenterologist. And what I like about it is because um, I do a lot of different things. And for medical students out there, I, I think some of the major decisions you want to make is like, you know, do you want to work with kids? Do you want to work with, you know, men? Do you want to work with women? Do you want to work with both? Those are like, do you want to work with older people? You, you know what I mean? Those are like big decisions you need to make. Mm -hmm. um, and then you need to decide, well, do you just want to have a clinic-based practice or do you want to do procedures or do you want to do both? Um, so for me, when I went through my rotations, I was one of those people who kind of like liked a lot of stuff, but didn't really love anything, so to speak. Um, so I remember, you know, being on medicine, I didn't necessarily love being in medicine. When I did surgery, like I like surgery. I didn't love being in R. Some of my classmates who ended up, you know, being surgeons, they mm -hmm. love that stuff. They're just, I just want to be in the R all the time. That's all I want to do. And I'm like, well, you know, I like it for like the first hour. <laughs> 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 right. <laughs> and then after a while, it's just like, man, this is kind of long. 
Um, and, you know, with ob Gun, like, I liked it, but I want to see more than just women. With Urology, I liked it. I want to see more than just men. Um, and with gastroenterology, I feel like it was the, the perfect combination for someone who likes everything but didn't love one particular thing. Yeah. And, and, and what I mean by that is just like, look, I get to go to the OR still. Um, so for some people who are like, oh, you know, you're a medical school student. This is your last time to be in the OR. Not true. Not for me. Mm-hmm. Like, I go to the OR. I work with the surgeons. Like, I get to see laparoscopy and whatnot. And, um, you know, I do I do my own procedures. I'm a gastroenterologist. I'm, I'm doing stuff. And we're putting, you know, feeding tubes and certain stuff. Like, I could suture if I want to. I can, you know, I, when we do our peg tubes, I got to make an incision. <laughs> so that, that technically it's not surgery, but I, I have a scalpel <laughs> in my hand. <laughs> yeah, close enough. <laughs> close enough. Um, and, you know, if somebody's bleeding, uh, like, I can suture it up. Uh, it's fine. So I, I feel like I'm using that skill set still. And I can still throw a one-handed knot as good as anybody. <laughs> that makes one of us. And I get to be in the clinic. Uh, so I, I like being able to talk to folks about high blood pressure and diabetes and whatnot. And with my obesity clinic, I get to do as much diabetes and high blood pressure as I want. So I'm still using that internal medicine hat. Um, and then same with my nutrition uh, experience. Like it's a, when you're managing IV nutrition and whatnot, I'm, seeing, I'm in the ICUs all the time. So I see, you know, critical illness. I get the work with the ICU doctors um, and even with the PEG tubes and the feeding tubes and whatnot, like the people who, a lot of people who need those are often critically ill. So the aspects that I liked about my internal medicine residency and the training, I still get to go to the ICU and still get to be involved in that whole critically critical care environment. Uh, I just don't have to do it all the time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and with my GI clinic, I, have, I like being in clinic. I like talking to people about gastrointestinal problems and helping people feel better. Um, get to do that. Um, I, I like my hemoc rotations as a, as a resident. I see a lot of people with cancer. Um, but I don't necessarily have to be the person just, you know, giving out chemotherapy all the time. Right. Uh, I get to, you know, work in conjunction with the oncologists. I get to work in conjunction with the surgeons. And, uh, you know, the cardiologists, they're trying to, you know, send me a lot of patients to help them lose weight. Uh, so mm-hmm. I get to work with people undergoing cardiac rehab. So for me, uh, in what I do as a gastroenterologist, specifically as a gastroenterologist, gastroenterologist focused on nutrition, I get to experience a, a wider breadth of medicine, but not enough where I get bored. <laughs> yeah. No, it's awesome. And I also get to work with great anesthesiologists like yourself. <laughs> there we go. And, and hopefully we'll be working together uh, soon in a couple of years. I, I look forward to it. <laughs> one more thing. I do teaching. So at an academic institution, uh, one of the benefits of being in academics and not being in private practice, which is no, nothing wrong with private practice, but in academics, you potentially will have the opportunity to teach trainees at all different levels. Uh, so I get to be the person giving the lectures for the first and second year medical students. Okay. So University of Chicago, when people learn about diarrhea and you know malabsorption, and I even teach in the health disparities lecture, it's me giving those lectures. Um, and I, and I like being that person, especially as a person of color, because when I was a medical student at Northwestern, like we didn't have I didn't see black male faculty. Right. And I, I definitely, you know, didn't see any, you know, uh, I didn't see black faculty for, for the most part and definitely not given like hardcore lectures uh, about, you know, I do like the carbohydrates and the protein absorption lectures. I'm all up in the physiology. Uh, so I, I enjoy being that person. And I enjoy teaching the fellows, you know, how to do perform procedures. And uh, with our nutrition fellows, uh, like, you know, I'm teaching the fellows, TPN Nutrition, they're coming into my obesity clinic. And, you know, right now, our nutrition fellow uh, is someone that you introduced me to. Oh, yeah. Right on. Yeah. Yeah. So you tell me at Rush, they had a black fellow. Uh, and he was the last black fellow to come through uh, since I uh, finished the program in gastroenterology. <laughs> so you got us in contact. And, 
This is where mentorship and reaching out. Yeah, I mean, you you just never know where this stuff takes you. Yeah. But you got us in contact, and I met with him. We would go out quarterly. I take him out to a restaurant or a bar. We get drinks and just kind of catch up, make sure the brother was doing well in fellowship. And I was really a um, kind of source he can confide in because you know training can be tough. Uh, yeah. So. You know, sometimes you just need to have somebody you can bounce some ideas off of and just run some things by. So I tried to be that person because I wish I had somebody like that when I was going through training. Uh, but in that process, he got interested in nutrition. And I'm in a position <laughs> where I could be like, oh, we'll make you our nutrition fellow. And he's my nutrition fellow. <laughs> oh, that, I mean, I, when, you, when I found out how that worked out, man, like that made my entire week. That made my month. Yeah. I mean, that was... You made that connection. Had it not been for you, I may not have crossed paths with him. That's dope. Well, Ed, thanks again for coming on the show. Thanks for all the knowledge that you've shared. Where can the people find you? What are your socials? What are your um, uh, your blog posts, websites, all that? Yeah, so uh, I have my website, uh, www.thedocskitchen. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at uh, the Docs Kitchen 4 and Facebook the Docs Kitchen. We have a podcast, Trying to Live podcast that I do with a couple of buddies. So you can check it out. Check us out there. I need to probably do some more episodes, but it's, it's, it's hard being a podcaster, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, tell me about it. Like, like, people don't know the editing and all that stuff. It takes time. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that is a, a work in progress. So I got some, you know, other stuff brewing. And you can check my wife out at Dr. Every Woman. Well, Ed, uh, thank you so much. And uh, we'll, we'll keep an eye on, on what you're doing down there on the south side of Chicago. Appreciate that, man. The Black Doctors Podcast is a nonprofit volunteer passion project with the goal of inspiring all who listen. Tune in next week for another episode of the Black Doctors Podcast with Dr. Stephen Bradley, your friendly neighborhood anesthesiologist.